Welcome to Legacy Cast, your source for hearing from top influencers, industry experts, and successful business owners who are telling their unique story about life, values, goals, business strategies, and the various causes they are so passionate about. Future generations will come to be impacted by what is happening today, whether positive or negative, and our mission is to focus on what is going to affect change for the better. Hosted each weekday by James Snow, a former U.S. Army combat medic, now founder and principal advisor of James Advisors Group, a full-service financial planning firm in North Texas. This is Legacy Cast. Welcome, Legacy Cast listeners. This is your host, James Snow, coming to you from North Texas. And I have with me today a great guy, uh, Manny. Uh, and, and Manny's going to talk to you about uh, all sorts of great stuff and just really, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you'll be able to get your world turned upside down and inside out and sideways and all sorts of stuff and just really change the way that you're, you're thinking about things. And uh, so, you know, without further ado, I'll just bring Manny into the program. Welcome, Manny. Hey, thank you. Thank you, James. It's good to be here, man. And um, yeah, let's get this thing going. So, uh, now, just before we came on the air, uh, you're you're telling me about uh, about a group that you you have going, and I, I want to make sure that you know, we kind of get get that out in the open because that's something that's going to be of, of immense value to people. So, uh, you know, tell me about that group. Yeah, so <clears throat> my group is called the One Thousand Speakers Academy. That's the number one thousand, and really, what it is is it's a it's a group for primarily coaches who want to tell their story and in so doing, they really have a desire to make an impact, change the world and money. And those three things really need to sort of go together in order to, um, well, let's put it this way. If you really want to make impact without, you know, shooting up a school or something, you have to be making money. Your impact and your money are related. Um, and so what I do is I, I draw stories out of coaches put them on stages and show them how to use the story in the stage to grow a thriving coaching business while they're really kind of living in their purpose. Right. Excellent. Yeah. And so the group is the 1000 speakers Academy on Facebook and uh, that's where you go to do those things. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah. And, and that's uh, really a, a good thing because, you know, nowadays, you know, Facebook is such a, a huge uh, environment for people. Yeah. <clears throat> And, you know, just being able to, you know, like the, the public speaking and being able to do Facebook lives, uh, mm -hmm. that is such a, a big force and being able to get your, your message out and getting your brand out there. Yeah. So one of the things, I mean, you've probably heard other people say that there are 2 billion people on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's never been a time in human history, and I'm sure this isn't news to you either or to your listeners, where we had the opportunity to just sort of show up and speak up and through doing that actually attract an audience, actually attract um, what we call a tribe. You know? And so what's the difference between a tribe and an audience? Well, an audience is there and they listen. A tribe follows, you know, learns from you, um, pays you for your expertise and that, that kind of thing. And um, there are two sides to this unique time in history. One side is if you have a phone you can, and a Facebook account, you can start to reach people. That's good. There's a bad side to this too, which is that so many people do it and most of them do it terribly. And so on the one hand, we have this unique opportunity to do what only corporations and businesses have been able to do prior to this. On the other hand, um, Folks just ain't that good at it. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a, there's a lot of carnival barkers out there who um, mm -hmm. maybe for a series of different reasons should just keep their mouths shut, <laughs> whether it's not being good on camera, not being good in front of a crowd, or, or, or just trying to say and, and do, you know, things that are unethical. And so you can access this platform, but you need to be able to stand out. And that's kind of what I do, right? That's, that's what I do in my group and my coaching, in my speaking and training. 
going to show you how to stand out, how to capture the attention of the people who I would call your perfect people so mm -hmm. that your tribe is your perfect people um, and, and how to serve and thrive from that. Sure. And, you know, with, with what you're doing there, <clears throat> you know, obviously that that's going to have a, a huge impact as far as, you know, what your legacy is, you know, since, you know, that's yeah. kind of what we talk about on legacy cast. Uh, it is, you know, what you're building there is, you know, you're helping people to in turn, you know, create their legacy. And so, you know, when you're, when you're hearing about when you hear about legacy, though, what's the first thing that comes to your mind, though, Manny? That's funny because I was going to ask you the same question. <laughs> <laughs> so as I get older, you know, um, I come from an experience, a childhood, a past of spending 28 years either being too young to contribute or do anything meaningful or taking from society. That was my first 28 years of my life. Mm -hmm. I was an unapologetic drug addict, criminal, you know, um, that's, that's what I was. And so I took from society. Always inside of myself, I had this part of me that, that I refer to now as the moral man. It's the part of me that wanted to be good. Mm -hmm. But he was trapped. He was trapped by my conditioning. He was trapped by my beliefs. In effect, James, he was trapped by the stories I told myself about what reality And so he never got a chance to exert himself or to, to influence my behavior until day before, a couple days before my, about a month before my 28th birthday, I had a big, like seriously life-changing experience where I decided I was willing to abandon my entire life rather than hunt someone down and attempt to kill it. So that was my turning point. And from there, that was so profound an experience for me. It was so scary, so visceral, so real. I mean, it's, it's one thing to see it on TV. <laughs> it's another thing entirely to hold a gun in your hand and be discussing the plans for killing someone. That's some heavy shit. Right. So from realizing I wasn't willing to do that to quickly finding a way out of the situation, um, I, had to for, I had to let go of everything I had ever known because I couldn't stay in that environment with other criminals and drug addicts and outlaws and, right. and not follow through with this thing. It would have marked me. So then I went through minimum of 10 years where I was just trying to figure out who the hell's other side of me that I wanted to express. So now we're at 38 years of not really contributing to society, right? right. Uh, so you talk about what is Lego mean to me the further I get from that period in my life the more it's like I have a strong desire to know that I've contributed more than I've taken yeah yeah right I want to balance those scales and, and I mean that I mean that seriously like that's not just a clever thing to say it, it's what drives me it's what makes me serve people it's what led me to asking the question for years and years on end of what can I do with my life that's going to take all of the things I'm good at, require me to grow and expand and serve other people at the highest level I can possibly serve them at. Right. For me, the answer to that wound up being communication, which I do through training public speakers, training coaches mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but that was the answer. And so for me, my legacy is sort of maybe, maybe obscurely, but it's built into the name of what I do, 1,000 Speakers Academy. I want to train 1,000 speakers a year whose mission it is to act as candles, right? Not regular speakers, not platform pitch sellers, not, you know, paid endorsers. I want people who have a story to tell. I want to show them how to tell that story so that they can each go out and inspire 1,000 other people. Mm -hmm. so that's what legacy means to me yeah and and i like that you you used uh there at the end uh the word story because really uh a legacy is is just that you know it's yeah. it's not just you know a financial conversation or or educational conversation or whatever you know though right. though if you ask 100 people you'll get 100 different answers of what legacy means right. ultimately though uh when you when you take that and average it out 
it, it's someone's story being told their way about the things that matter to them that they affected change, hopefully for the yeah. positive, and mm -hmm. and what they did to make the world better. You know, so yeah. that that's kind of you know my my honed down definition of, of legacy. So I'm yeah. glad that you mentioned that because you know it, it really is that, and it, it gives us uh, sort of a the the ability to uh, have that taste of immortality, if you will, uh, sure. to where you know we can we can affect deliberately you know what we're doing today that's going to resonate for for many generations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like uh, people should be very deliberate and intentional in what they're doing from day to day to day, because, you know, it is going to make that kind of an impact, you know, and whether, whether you think about it or not, you know, it's going to make either a positive or negative one. And so, you know, right. we, we do have to be very intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would your, your views on legacy maybe affect uh, your business though? Uh, how would you say that that, that comes in? Yeah, so I mean, the whole business is legacy driven in a sense. Right. You know, um, legacy is the story. And when we're gone, what we have left, I mean, we have potentially physical contributions, but what we have left is what story people tell about us when we're gone. Right. And so what I've discovered in my work that I didn't realize in the beginning of it, well, when I started this, I didn't realize it was my life's work for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a very profound thing for me to uncover over time. Um, I have a very, very deep, very powerful methodology for putting your life story together. Mm -hmm. And when I say it's deep and it's powerful, man, it's no joke. <laughs> it is serious, serious work. So, um, and, and I think that uh, that is, is going to be a crucial component of what I would say is my legacy is to, to have developed this, this methodology and it will outlive me, certainly if in no other way than in the way of the people I train from now until, you know, till I shuffle off the mortal coil. <laughs> but the thing that this storytelling methodology does in addition to some really powerful marketing and positioning stuff, which is important, even though I don't like to, you know, it's, it's not the main thing it does, but it will show you who your perfect target people are, your perfect audience. It will show you how to talk to your perfect audience. It will, through getting this story method correct, it will eliminate the need for sales, which I personally love because sales, I'm one of those guys that no matter how good I get at it, there's just some part of it that I don't like, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, I like the idea of not having to sell because it's so obvious that I can help you with what you do. And it's just a question of how do we start? So it does those things, but there's a super internal element to it where you go through it and you really pull out each part of your life and you organize them accordingly according to this model I use, um, what happens is what used to sort of bind you in trauma, you get liberated from. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, another way of saying it is uh, whatever was, whatever was hounding you gets the teeth taken out of it. And so this is a very powerful experience for people. And so that's a big part of my contribution. You know, it's not just that I help you be a more successful coach. It's that you actually transform in the process. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so uh, do you believe that, that it's important that people um, create for themselves, both on a personal and business level, uh, some sort of planning strategy, uh, business planning strategy, financial planning strategy, things of that sort? Uh, yeah, man, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I was indoctrinated into the sort of the whole just follow your bliss uh, <laughs> approach to life, and uh, it led me to the gutter. So I'm a big plan, uh, sorry, a big fan of, of plans and strategies, you know, to get where we want to go. I also, I, I also believe it's a soft touch, at least for me it is. 
you know, it's very important to have a plan that's sort of um, akin to, you know, having, having places you want to go, let's say, you know, the analogy I like is the, uh, the sea captain who knows he's going from California to Hawaii, but he doesn't know what turns he's going to make to get there until the ocean tells him. So with no plan to get to Hawaii, he's going to wind up anywhere the ocean takes him. Right. With, a, with a plan to get to Hawaii, he's just going to have to keep checking and adapting, knowing that that's his ultimate goal. So yeah, that's sort of the way that I, I uh, think of plans and strategies, but they're absolutely important. What I would say, though, is don't cling to them. True, true. You know, keep them, keep them flexible, keep them dynamic, keep them fluid. But What's that old expression? If you if you if you don't have a destination in mind, uh, anywhere you wind up is I can't remember, but you know the one I'm talking about. It's like wherever you wind up is is where you are. Yep. So, so that's a yes, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what what are you thinking, Manny? Uh, is the most common reason people are failing or giving up when they start a business? Hmm. In my experience, it's a combination of shiny object syndrome. I don't think we really understand the impact that shiny object syndrome has on our psyches. And so when you say a business, I make the assumption that you're talking about like uh, a coaching based online business. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, if that's what you're actually talking about, but um, I think it's easier in the online space to fall victim to shiny object syndrome. Mm-hmm. because, you know, going onto Facebook is, is just like, it's walking down a carnival midway and it's just people shouting at you from every side. You know what I mean? Trying to get you to do this and do that. And, and the, the, the 26 hour or six figure blueprint that you can do while you're standing on your head underwater and, and whatever else it is. Um, and I fell victim to this over and over again. I would say it's important to realize that, that, Changing your direction like a squirrel looking for nuts. Uh Um, There's the obvious problem that you're not going in in anything approaching a straight line, which is the shortest distance between two points. You're not going in anything approaching a straight line towards your goals. But there's this sort of like, there's this defeat, retreat, and regroup kind of feeling that we have every time we switch to a new shiny object. Because switching your thing means by de- definition, you're giving up on the, the last thing, right. right? And we have to grapple with that, whether it's conscious or not. And that takes a tremendous amount of what I would call our entrepreneurial energy. Right. So what are the biggest reasons? Um, I definitely think shiny object syndrome is one of them. Um, another one that I get from a lot of people in my own life and my own coaching is refusal to focus on one thing in the first place, right? As what what we call niching down. Right. You would, (laughs) you would either laugh or cry if you heard how many times people told me, and uh, I say, so, so we're writing your story. Who is this for? People who are suffering. Can we narrow it down a little bit? <laughs> you know, can we get a little bit clearer than say sixty percent of the population? Right? <laughs> you know? right? What kind of suffering is it? Men? Is it women? Are they old? Are they young? Do they like? Are they? Are they? You know, politically red or blue? Do they like this or that? Because I got news for you guys. If you're listening to this, uh, wanting to help people who are suffering is not good enough. You'll never, ever, ever be able to speak the language of the person who is suffering until you go deeper. So that's a big one. That's a big one. People refusing to niche down and say, I take transformational coaches. I draw their stories out of them. I I put them on stage and I show them how to use their story and the stage to grow their transformational coaching business. That's specific. Mm -hmm. Right. But people who are suffering doesn't mean anything. So I'd say those are the two biggest ones. 
Yeah, and, and good points to, to mention there as well, because, you know, definitely niching down is, is a huge issue because it's like, you know, fishing in the ocean, you know, it's a very wide space. And yeah. it's, you yeah. have a lot more success in a smaller pond. You know, mm -hmm. if you can find that pond and, and fish in it, then you're going you're gonna to catch something. Yeah. And it's amazing to me how people resist that, even though mm -hmm. it's such a known thing. It's common knowledge that we have to have a tight focus on who we serve. And yet everybody thinks somehow they're the one that's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so let me question. share with you, let me share with your listeners something. Prior to me niching down mm -hmm. and after. Because I don't, I don't teasingly criticize those who don't want to niche down from a place of judgment. I do it from a place of, hey, man, I was there. Right. Right? I did it. I was the same way. I wanted to help people who were suffering. Mm -hmm. Until I was convinced that that doesn't mean anything. So as I niche down, as I refused to niche down, I was afraid that if I, if I focused on one thing, you know, it would mean that I would not be able to focus on other things. Right. The main sort of interests in my life are communication, fitness, martial arts, music, and theater. Those are my big five. And for years, I couldn't figure out which one to do because I didn't want to abandon the others. Mm -hmm. So here's what I found since I focused on communication. In all these interesting ways, theater, martial arts, fitness, and uh, music – inform what I now do. Mm -hmm. So they found their way into it. So even though it didn't show up in the way I expected, as it turned out, I didn't have to let anything go. Right. If there, like that, that's the most valuable thing I will probably say to your audience in this, in this interview. I want you to know it's very likely that if whatever you're afraid of letting go is a true passion, it's going to stay with you and it's going to show up and it's going to add to how you uniquely help people. Very true. Very true. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so what, what are some of the maybe uh, roadblocks that you discovered, you know, in your career that, that you would warn somebody to look out for? And then likewise uh, resources that you've been able to take advantage of that you would advise people to look for. So, most of my roadblocks were internal. They continue to be internal. Um, one of the one of the the areas of coaching people and serving people, where I feel um, those that do this kind of coaching uh, have the weakest messaging, but yet the most potential to help would be mindset coaching. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's too broad. What does that mean? But what I can tell you is that in my own experience, um, so many of the things that, that to all of my senses seemed like they were problems outside of me wound up being problems inside of me. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is a monumental mind fuck, right? <laughs> it's just, I, 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 can't, I can't speak emphatically enough on how confusing it is to really, with all of your ability to perceive, think that the problems are outside of you, mm -hmm. only to discover that it's internal stuff. And the internal stuff shows up, by the way, in the stories we tell ourselves. What? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> earlier when I mentioned how powerful the transformation that happens internally through going through the storytelling process is, this is one of the things that happens is you stop seeing as many, uh, you know, self-doubt, mm -hmm. right? But self-doubt shows up as, well, I don't want to reach out to that big name influencer. But it's not even that clear, right? It's just this quick little sort of response in your head where you go, okay, I'm hungry to, to, to make forward progress here. What can I do? And maybe the thought occurs, oh, maybe there's a, 
you know, I can, I can uh, connect with some influencers to grow my awareness. And then instantly you kind of go, no, that's dumb. Right. And it seems like it's about that influencer. And it seems like it's about your guys' different social standing, but it's just the story in your head, man. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what they're going to say. <laughs> How could you possibly know what they're going to say? You have to talk to them to know what they're going to say. Right. And so it's things like that. Um, that inner dialogue stuff that, that what do we call the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. It, it has a way of projecting itself outside of you so that it seems like something you don't have control over. When in fact, you have absolute control over it. So I would say that, uh, that those inner sort of emotional and what I believe and don't believe blocks have been the biggest roadblocks for me. Okay. That and definitely, um, I've been guilty in the past over and over again of trying to get things off the ground without proper financing. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. If the dream is really good enough, it'll persist while you get the money together. <laughs> you know? That's true. So, so get the damn money together. <laughs> <clears throat> So as far as uh, resources, uh, are yeah. there particular resources you've been able to tap into, like a SCORE or a Small Business Administration or uh, anything you know, in particular? So. Back, when, back when my business was more uh, brick and mortar, when, it, when I was in construction, I had good luck with SCORE. Um, here and now, though, I mean, my business is, is virtually all coaching. And so... Yeah, not not resources per se. Mm -hmm. I would say, unfortunately, for you know, for the expectation that your listeners might have. Um, in fact, I've found it more powerful to stop grabbing every free resource. <laughs> you know, because <Okay. laughs> resources in the digital world, in the online world, um, are they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And what I found happened for me, and I think for a lot of people, is um, overwhelm, information overwhelm, mm -hmm. which sort of is the, uh, the Siamese twin of, of shiny object syndrome, right? right? Everybody's offering you this free guide and this free thing. And, and at first, it seems like, wow, if I could just pick the right combination of things, I could actually you know, start making money. Mm -hmm. But it just turns into a circle jerk. <laughs> It just turns yep. into a, a human centipede of, of, you know, information overload. And um, so what I do now is I'm very, very, very selective of who I follow. Mm -hmm. And even 10 times, 100 times more selective of what information I actually take. Okay. You know, and, and again, this is special to, uh, unique to uh, coaching, I think. Uh, if you had a brick and mortar kind of a business, it's a different, it's a different issue. Places like score uh, places that'll help you to put a plan in place to create business credit, things like that. Those are useful for, for those kind of businesses. For my business, the main thing I need, and I say this a little bit tongue in cheek is for everybody just to shut the hell up. <laughs> <clears throat> You know what I mean? It's like, like, hey, I'm working over here. Just leave me alone. Just let me do my thing. Yep, cool. Yeah. So what is something uh, maybe earlier in life that, that you did not do that you wish you had done at this point? <laughs> That's my whole life, man. <laughs> like my whole life is stuff like that. Or things I didn't do that I wish I had or things I did do that I wish I had. Um, seriously, though. For me, number one, number one would have been um, saving money earlier. Yeah. You know, I just think that I could have gotten any number of really good ideas, entrepreneurial ideas off the ground, had it only been for uh, more financial resources. Yeah. So that would be like, Number one with a bullet for me, it's really important to make the connection that uh, money equals the power of choice. 
and, and with, you know, with resources come opportunities. Yep. That's true. Yeah. And I see so many people shoestringing it, which I totally get and I've done, but um, it's so much harder. It's so much harder to, to feel easy, you know, when you live and die by each financial decision. Yeah, so for me, that that would be the one. So when you were starting your coaching business, <clears throat> or the uh, the business in general that you have, yeah, um, what what were some of the the hurdles getting started that you ran into? You know, just kind of getting that off the ground. Sure, man. Good, good, uh, good question. And I started by thinking I would start as an author. Your audience probably can't see it, but you can probably see that book on the shelf behind you. Right. That's my book of my life story, uh, written using the same methodology I teach people to use now. And by every single account, it's not just me bragging, it's an excellent book. And I don't say that to brag. I say that because um, I had to learn the hard way that writing a great book doesn't mean jack. <laughs> it just doesn't mean anything that is quite possibly literary track ever be discovered right um it, it went to international bestseller in two hours and still didn't make a ripple in the pond so then i then i i started to do research and and say well how does an unknown guy get a book deal well you have to build a platform you have to build an audience. So the next question was, what's the best way to build an audience? First answer that came to me was podcasting. Okay. So I said, okay, I'll do a podcast. And it's a great way to build an audience. And it is definitely an endurance race and not a sprint, right? As, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but it is an amazing way to build an audience. I didn't have the patience for it as it turned out. But in doing my podcast, the funniest thing happened. And Steve Jobs talks about this connecting the dots from reverse, you know, where you look back and you realize what unique sort of things you might have that you can put together to serve people. Mm -hmm. From the first episode, the first release, people started messaging me and saying, can you teach me how to sound like you? Right? <laughs> Nothing to do with my content whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> they said, can you teach me how to sound like you? And uh, people would send me messages saying, you have the coolest podcast voice I've ever heard and stuff like that. And then somebody finally said, what do you charge to teach me how to sound like you? And so that's when I had that connect the dots in reverse moment. And it occurred to me, I've trained as an actor. I've trained as a singer, you know, I know, um, I know how to develop voices. I know what it takes to be emotive, seductive, powerful, vulnerable, and how to do that with your voice. So the first guy ever, I, I was so green, I didn't even know what PayPal was. <laughs> and so the guy says to me, you know, I'm afraid my voice is just, just too boring. And I've got an, a podcast that's a big part of my business. Can you help me sound like you? And I said, yeah, what I'm going to need you to do is drive to my bank and deposit $397 in my bank account. <laughs> and when you do that, you know, that'll be for a month of coaching. And, uh, and that was how I made my first sale. And since then, I've had $10,000 sales. And I got to tell you, that first $397 was the most exciting. <laughs> I bet. I bet. But anyway, um, so... It was, uh, it was a matter of looking backwards and saying, hold on, no, I can do this. And that's actually how I wound up teaching speaking. Mm -hmm. Because I had this book that I had no promotional budget for the book. I had very little promotional strategy. The thing took off like wildfire based on people telling their friends and buying it for their friends, which has to mean the storytelling is good. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you... That doesn't happen with business books. Right. So I kind of I kind of look back and said, I can teach voice, I can teach body language, I can teach storytelling. 
You know, I've done some public speaking in the past. So like through all of these things, I started to sort of, um, a, a clear offering started to come together. But as you can see, it was way different from what I thought it was going to be in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you, when you decided to, to start going in this direction with it as a business, uh, did you have a particular uh, kind of a light bulb moment or an aha moment that said, you know, this is, this is what many is going to do? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. My light bulb moment, if you want to call it that, was when the things that I was talking about and teaching people caught the attention of an influencer who would, I would say, was much further along in his career than I was. Right. And he reached out to me and said, hey, look, I'm putting together this, um, uh, this business course for how to make money public speaking. And I'm, I'm a good public speaker, but the content that you're talking about and you're teaching people is a great fit. And how would you like to talk about a partnership? I said, great. We talked and he said, the first thing you have to do is take your content that you have now and organize it. You have to use either alliteration <clears throat> or acronyms. So that it's super easy for people to wrap their head around. And in doing that, that was a real kind of a moment where, you know, some some information and some clarity and knowledge sort of came through me. So that was very powerful for me, actually. I was teaching what I was teaching, but it was very disorganized. And because it was disorganized, it was sort of hard to talk about. Other than to say, yeah, I'll teach you how to be a good speaker. And then people would say, well, what does that mean? How are you going to do it? And then I'd go off into these long, elaborate discussions and and descriptions. Now, I say I've got three main things I teach you. I teach you storytelling through an acronym called STORY. How easy is that? I teach you body language through an acronym called POISE. How easy is that? And I teach you vocal tonality and how important that is through an acronym called STORY. Speak mm-hmm. to these simple, easy to remember acronyms, everything sort of dropped into place. I became better at teaching my content massively more clearly through that exercise. And so that's when it kind of all was like, now I can tell you what I do. Now I can tell you how I do it. Now I can start to talk about it, charge more for it, promise people outcomes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, besides what you're, you're doing currently, is there some other tr- sort of uh, profession that you think that you would ever want to go into? Mm, no, I dare not allow myself to think like that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I might go try to do it. <laughs> so that shiny, shiny yeah. Object. So the official answer, yeah, the official answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, what would you say your your greatest uh, character strength though is? Hmm. Good question. Yeah. Um, now I feel like it's a job interview. <laughs> what Absolutely. would you say your biggest strength is? Well. I'd say I care too much. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'm a very good teacher. Okay. And I mean very good. And I'm a very good teacher in a world of people who draw a false equivalency between having done a thing and assuming that they can then teach others to do it. Mm-hmm. In my professional industry, um, it's full of those people people who have gotten on stage, who have booked stages, who have sold from the stage and assume that because they did that, they can teach you only to find out that their, their training and their ability as teachers is utterly weak. Mm -hmm. You know, but the problem is people don't find that out until $10,000 later. Right. Right. On the flip side of that, on the flip side, uh, what would you say the greatest weakness would be then? I'd say I care too much. 
No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. My greatest weakness, uh, I suppose it's also a, a strength. I, I, I get very invested in um in the success of people you know sometimes oftentimes more so than they do yeah yeah and that of course can be heartbreaking <laughs> uh when, when you're doing a brainstorming and getting your ideas uh do you do you find that you go to a particular place to to do that brainstorming uh maybe nature or you know the shower or what have you well, not as such, but I really, really place a premium on being able to go on walks and get outside. Um, I live, fortunately for me, I live in a very, very beautiful area and we have walking trails all around our house. So um, it's super important, but I don't like strategically use it to brainstorm. You know, okay. it's just, it's just changing environments is good for the soul. Mm -hmm. So if you're to describe uh, your, what a day looks like uh, in, in your business life uh, for someone mm -hmm. just starting, how would you describe that? I would describe it as the absolute least amount of work I can possibly do, but with the highest leverage. Mm -hmm. So some days might look like three enrollment calls and that's it. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, that's that's the highest leverage work I can do is bringing new people in. Um, some days might look like today was uh, back to back to back calls. Uh, all of them good and, and worthwhile, but uh, you know it's exhausting for a guy like me. Paradoxically, even though I'm a speaker and a speaking coach, I'm very six hours straight. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there is no average day. That's kind of the life of an entrepreneur, but my goal, and I'm refining this all the time is to take as much off my plate as possible and only do the things that, that absolutely move the needle the most. Okay. And, uh, in, in winding out, uh, our, our time this afternoon, Mm -hmm. I have a, a trivia question, if you will. Uh, if you can mention something that most people do not know about Manny Wolf, what would that be? Well, I did write a book about my life, so. <laughs> 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 Let's see. One thing that most people don't know about me that's totally random is that I'm a uh, I'm very much a lifetime fitness kind of junkie, mm -hmm. you know, for the rest of my life, I'll be into fitness. And I got to, I got to a point once where I could bench press over twice my body weight. Wow. Yeah. So that's very trivia based. We'll, we'll do no one any good to know that whatsoever, but it is true. At, at, awesome. at one point I weighed a hundred and, 80 pounds and no 175 pounds and I could bench press 365. Goodness. So how's that for useless trivia? <laughs> <laughs> Exciting stuff, man. Exciting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for our listeners, you know, obviously they're, they're going to want to be able to get, reach out to you and, and be mm -hmm. able to contact you to, to take advantage of what you can, what you can bring to the table. So how would they, sure. how would they reach out? Well, join my group is the one and only thing I suggest they do. And I've actually sent you the link to it in messenger. Um, but the, the customized link is tinyurl.com forward slash Manny group, all one word, tinyurl.com forward slash Manny group. I'll take you right there. Just like that. Perfect. Yeah. Can't right. get any easier than that. What's that? Does it get any easier than that? That's, That's the goal, easy. right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want Those you overthinking anything. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Benny, I appreciate your time this this afternoon uh, coming in and you know giving the listeners something to to think about and to chew on and you know, just uh, helping them to understand you know your world and what you're doing to make things better and to to be able to impact lives. So you know, I appreciate you carving out time of your schedule. I know you're very busy, and you know, like us, I, I enjoy saying to all of my honored guests here, I'll see you around the bend, my friend. All right, man. Thanks so much, James. Thank you, both. All right. You've been listening to Legacy Cast. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to come back next time as we speak with more top influencers, industry experts, and business owners from around the world.